Hey everyone, welcome to the Sunny Go One Piece podcast. On this episode, we're going to be talking about anime episodes 43 through 45, which will be covering manga chapters 93 through 96. And here we see the end of the Arlong Park arc, in addition to seeing the fallout, as well as some big revelations of defeating Arlong. So let's get right into it. So the synopsis... The final climax of the Luffy vs. Arlong fight arrives with Luffy coming out victorious and declaring that Nami is his Nagama with her accepting and the entire island celebrates their freedom from Arlong's reign while everyone also reflects on all that they had to endure and look forward to the future. The crew with Nami officially a member now head towards their next destination but before that they along with the rest of the east blue learn of luffy's new infamy and the bounty placed on him by the marines so getting into the differences most of the big changes come in episode 45 as there is quite a bit of filler added in we get an extra few reaction shots from various people along Luffy's journey, like Kaya, Zeph, Kobe, Morgan, and Captain Kuro, which were never featured in the manga. But um, it's interesting that they threw in Kuro there, because we actually never know what happens to Kuro after he's defeated by Luffy. However, we would go on to learn more about Kaya, Zeph, Kobe, and Morgan all in future, well, not their own stories, but a little bit of side stories every now and then. Of course, we then get that experience extended filler interaction with full body while they're out at sea and then finally getting back to the canon sequences of events that play out at the end of episode 45 the order is actually very shuffled between the anime and the manga so in the manga it goes from that marine scene to luffy talking about his new bounty and him being very excited about it and then they all decide to go to log town but then it immediately cuts to them already in Logtown in the next page. And then we finally get to the Mihawk and Shanks um, interaction. And then we get to the Makino and the mayor of um, Windmill or Fusha Village talking about, you know, whether it's fate or not. But in the anime, it's shuffled around with going from the full body interaction. Then we go to the Mihawk and Shanks meeting. Then we get to the um, Fusha Village scene, concluding with Luffy deciding to head to Logtown, but we never actually get to see them there, as that's saved for a few episodes later down the line. So yeah, nothing too dramatic. All the major beats are still there. They're just shuffled around so that they can flow better with the filler material that they throw in there. Okay, so starting off, I want to go back to something I said I wanted to wait on speaking about last episode, and that is the scene with Arlong and Luffy in Nami's old cartography room. And one thing that always stood out to me is just how astute, observant, aware, and empathetic Luffy is in this particular scene when he notices the maps and most of all when he picks up the blood-soaked pen. He puts it all together what this room was for and what happened to Nami in it as well as what it must represent to her. And it's all done so well here with barely any dialogue on Luffy's part. And to me, it always seemed like he wasn't even listening to Arlong rambling on about how proud he was about taking advantage of Nami's gifts and was just processing this in his head right up until Arlong asks if he could use Nami as well as he did. And that's when Luffy gets really pissed off, glaring at Arlong and yelling, Use? I really like this moment as it reminds us of a moment when Nami observed Luffy yelling at Kuro for not valuing his Nakama as he slices them up. It's a really great moment because it's it's subtly hinting at the fact that, again, Luffy is much more deeper than we actually think. He is very much more observant and deeper and actually has the capacity for very rational thought despite his, you know, his simple-mindedness and kind of stupidity in most other situations. But when it comes to people, it seems like he's just a genius in sort of reading them and understanding them and sort of empathizing with them. I also really like that little detail of Luffy being bit by Arlong but then breaking Arlong's saw nose. I feel like this is significant because earlier when facing Zoro, Arlong particularly boasts about how he's proud of his nose because it won't break. But here's Luffy pretty much showing that Arlong is not as strong as he thinks and pretty much signifies the win at this point by breaking that one thing that Arlong is actually really proud of. And it's a nice symbolic gesture, the fact that Luffy has basically beaten Arlong at this point. But then we get that classic One Piece dong moment 
with an extreme close-up of Luffy's angry face and angrier than we've ever seen it, with him quietly but very aggressively saying that because this room exists, Nami can't leave and declares that he's going to destroy it. Like, oh my god, it's so satisfying and epic to see Luffy this serious and angry because you know by now it takes a lot to piss Luffy off. So if you've managed to do it this badly, then you've done effed up. And you're about to get your ass handed to you. And I love that they kept the detail on his face with the shadow lines straight out of the manga for this one shot. And it looks amazing. Then we get Luffy kicking his leg up in the air while Arlong launches another shark on darts. And Luffy deals the finishing blow with a massive Gomu Gomu no battle axe. And it continues to surprise me how physically strong Luffy is. It seems like there's no end to his super strength as he slams Arlong through like five floors into the ground demolishing Arlong Park. Then we get another quite iconic moment in One Piece of Luffy rising up out of the collapsed debris of Arlong Park to reveal he has come out victorious and then uses all of his breath to scream out, NAMI! You are my nakama or NAMI! OMAI ORE NO NAKAMA DA! And finally, once and for all, Nami is part of the crew with her tearfully agreeing. It's such an amazing moment. And this is one of those moments right here why I highlighted the distinction of the word Nakama earlier on in in a few episodes during the Syrup Village arc. Because it means so much more than just crewmate or friend. And this is why it's so significant in the contrast of how Luffy uses the word and the perverse twisted way that Arlong used it to describe their relationship. Because to Nami, it's so painful to attach such a deep and intimate relationship label such as Nakama to someone like Arlong, but then to finally see it used the way it's supposed to be by Luffy who has throughout their journey shown Nami that more intimate family-like care and respect a Nakama actually deserves. And when you think about it, this is a slow burning plot thread that's been around since Orange Island with Nami consistently denying being part of the crew and saying she's only teaming up for her own means, but never acknowledging that she was Luffy's Nakama every time he tried to invite her. The fact she's finally free to choose who her Nakama are, and that Luffy, who she has come to understand what that word means to him, is more than happy to join, finally. It's just amazing to see all these little moments of Nami observing each member, whether it be Luffy, Zoro, Usopp, Sanji, what that word truly means to each of them while also learning how Arlong used that term to refer to Nami leading up to this moment is something special. It's really special and so effective because it was done with this long overarching story thread and the character development. While not being the forefront of any of those arcs, those little breadcrumbs really add up to finally something incredibly rewarding 40 some odd episodes later and it's so amazing. Yeah, the fact that he has these innocuous small character moments or details laced throughout the story only for it to culminate into something amazing and pay off when it comes time. The thing is, you never forget these moments. They become burned in your head because of how memorable and incredible they are and just the emotions you feel when you originally experienced them. Another thing that always took me by surprise and still does to this day is just how much joy I have with the celebration here, as if I was part of it. And I feel the same joy the villagers do. I also have to mention that little joke of uh, Sanji lunging at Nojiko for a celebratory hug, but (laughs) whiffs completely as Nojiko rightfully turns to Genzo for a hug. I always burst out laughing at that image of Sanji just completely getting shut down as he's just hugging nothing in the middle of the air. We get a nice moment of satisfying comeuppance with Nezumi, that corrupt marine, as he gets beat up by the Straw Hats as a whole, but also Nami gets her extra hits in as well, getting her money back. But the reason I want to mention this scene is because here we see Nezumi threaten Luffy about something big is going to happen to him. (laughs) And I also love that Luffy innocently interprets this as him somehow being aware that Luffy is going to be the Pirate King, (laughs) But, but this would obviously foreshadow Luffy's first bounty poster. And his picture is the best. The smiling wave with Usopp's head in the background. Nothing beats that wanted poster. The whole island 
continues to celebrate and party while Zoro finally gets actual medical attention for his wounds and injuries. And we get another bit of foreshadowing here of who their next crew member might be. And they bring up the fact that they will need a doctor pretty soon. And so hopefully we will see a new crew member at some point in the near future. Also, Luffy's running joke here of wanting a musician first and foremost <laughs> comically comes up again. And Zoro's like, why? And Luffy's like, well, because pirates sing. So it checks out. I think one of my favorite things about One Piece is during the conclusion of each arc or saga, we get to see many interactions we normally wouldn't see, as well as just the crew being normal people and hanging out with each other and being themselves in a relatively normal setting. I love these little character interactions because they're really fun. I mean, they're just really fun to see these characters. At these moments, we just love these characters so much and they're so well realized that we just want to learn more about them and see them as people. A couple examples of this are seeing Nami getting her new tattoo, as well as seeing Luffy's conversation with Genzo at Bellamere's grave, or even Zoro and Sanji just having like a normal conversation, which is something we rarely ever get to see. And one thing that gets overlooked, at least by me, is just how amazing of a sister Nojiko is, and how strong she's been for Nami, being a semi-mother figure to her as the older sister, protecting her secret, being there for her, caring for her, as well as getting her own set of tattoos to match Nami and make it less alienating for Nami. I mean, she is a true hero to Nami and should be recognized as such. And I, you know, I think the first couple times through the story, I kind of just never paid attention to Nojiko. But upon multiple rewatches, I've come to really appreciate Nojiko's character. I really love seeing all the resolution to Bellamere's stories too. Genzo visits her grave to share a drink and celebration to recognize how Nami and Nojiko have grown up to be these amazing women that she should be proud of as well as to commit their lives to their fullest for all the sacrifices she and everyone else has made. I like that Genzo makes Luffy promise to never take Nami's smile away when he suddenly shows up and promises never to take Nami's smile. This scene takes on a bigger meaning after you see the epilogue flashback at the end of the episode when we learn what the pinwheel means on his head. He's recognizing that it is no longer his duty to maintain Nami's smile and he is symbolically passing that duty on to Luffy and makes him promise never to take her smile away. I don't know why, but upon rewatch when I realized this, it really makes me tear up how important this scene really is to Genzo. And I like that they get to share this moment. And it's weird that I never put this connection together up until this particular rewatch, even though I've seen this episode probably like a dozen times. Then of course we have the great scene of Nami saying goodbye and leaving her childhood home. There's not much I have to say about this scene other than it's really heartfelt, beautiful, and perfect. Especially the moment where Nami gets an encouraging push out the door by the spirit of Bellamere, and it just perfectly bookends the story of Bellamere and Nami. Another little detail I noticed on rewatch is Luffy's reaction to how Nami leaves and says goodbye to the village. Nami leaves her own way by just kind of running around pickpocketing everybody without a normal goodbye. And I really like how Luffy has no problem with this and lets Nami do her own thing. Keeping up with his whole letting people, especially his crew, be free to do whatever they want. This is especially contrasted by the fact that even Usopp and Sanji expressed some concern if it really was okay to let her leave like that. But to Luffy, he still respects everybody's freedom and just says, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> One joke I really love, again with Sanji at the end, is as they're about to leave Kokoyashi and that there's a chance that maybe Nami is not going to join them. Sanji's worried that because she won't, she will stay on the island. And he states that 98.72% of the reason why he joined the crew in the first place was to be with Nami. <laughs> and I love how specific it is down to the 100th decimal point <laughs> with that percentage. And then we finally get to see that epilogue where Genzo's reasoning for the pinwheel is it's also really touching and a sweet bookend to the Arlong Park arc and brings the grave scene back full circle why he's so emphatically adamant about Luffy never taking her smile away. Now that he can't watch over Nami anymore and be there to make sure she's happy and smiling, it now falls to Luffy and he wanted to be sure that he knew the weight and responsibility that Luffy has to Nami's happiness. Like I said earlier, this is something... I had not actually noticed until this particular rewatch and it really warms my heart and makes both of those scenes much more special, I feel like. 
Next, we're going to flip over to a scene where we finally get to see one of the Marine headquarters. And we also learn a little bit more of the bounties of the pirates Luffy has beat thus far. With Luffy now getting his own iconic wanted poster and a bounty set at 30 million berries, which seems high. And that picture is awesome, especially when we see these intimidating and villainous wanted posters of Buggy, Krieg, and Arlong. And then Luffy's happy, smiling poster gets slapped over them. It's just so funny to see that. I don't know why it's so funny, but it just is. Also, the Marine giving the briefing on Luffy is another one of those funny Marine name sightings with his name being brand new. <laughs> like, where does he come up with these names? I have no idea why I get a kick out of these ridiculous names, but they're always super funny to me. The rest of the episode sees us getting to see everyone's reaction to Luffy's new bounty poster, which is always fun to see, getting getting to see how everyone the Straw Hats have interacted with are doing, and also seeing how happy and proud they all are. But unexpectedly, we got to see something I was not expecting the very first time I read through this section. Not only do we get to see Mihawk's reaction to the news, but crazily enough, we get to see none other than Shanks' reappearance in the modern time as well as his reaction to Luffy's ascendance, and it's perfect. I think it was just surprising because I had kind of forgotten about Shanks in terms of him playing a major role in the story when I had first read through this, but it would make total sense he'd learn of Luffy's first big step towards becoming a pirate. And the scene itself is so great as it subverts and plays with our expectations, setting up this intense atmosphere with some sort of an animosity or rivalry between these two pirates, even going so far as to shroud the main red-haired pirate crew in the shadows. Of course, this is Shanks we're talking about, and he just shifts on a dime and reverts to what we know, this light-hearted guy who just wants to party and invites Mihawk to sit down and have a drink. One interesting bit of the story, though, that gets revealed in a kind of a line that gets blown by if you don't pay attention is the fact that Shanks and Mihawk are in fact rivals and have dueled seemingly quite a bit in the past to pretty much a stalemate and have a standing duel but Mihawk doesn't feel Shanks would be a good match without his other arm. This means that Shanks was at least on the same level strength wise as a Shichibukai which gives us a better indication as to how strong Shanks is but I'll talk more about this in the spoiler section. But anyways, to finish these sets of episodes, we get a tease for what's to come. The crew talk about where to go next and determine that the next destination is the town of Beginnings and Endings, which is Logtown, the place where the former pirate king Gold Roger was born as well as executed. And upon hearing this, of course Luffy wants to go there. But anyways, there we have it. The epic conclusion to the Arlong Park arc filled with laughter, tears, excitement, and action. It is easily the best arc in the East Blue Saga and the arc that vaulted One Piece up into its legendary status that it holds to this day. And it really has almost never relinquished this status in its 20 plus year run. With the East Blue Saga winding down, we get to see the wider world expanding and we tease getting to the meat and potatoes of the story which is the Grand Line. We have a few more storylines to go through before we actually get to the Grand Line so yeah let's talk about those next few episodes on the next podcast. Anyways if you enjoyed this send me a like or comment and if you want to join me on this journey of rewatching One Piece please consider subscribing. I would really appreciate that. Also, you can go ahead and check out my Instagram and Twitter account at Podcast if you want updates of when I post new episodes and see some pictures, you know, of whatever. And as always, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to listen to my podcast. And yeah, this... I will have some pretty decent spoiler section on this episode, so if you wanted to stay for that, go ahead. But if not, I will see you next time. So bye. Alrighty, spoiler section. So this is kind of going to be more off the cuff. But uh, one thing I wanted to mention is the foreshadowing of the next crew member, which 
I forgot that this actually existed, but yeah, the fact that they said that they needed a doctor and the next crew member they actually ended up getting was a doctor. And we all know that the by the time they get to the to Drum Island, their next official crew member would be Chopper. And he is their doctor. And I I was actually kind of surprised by that. I don't know why I forgot about that little detail, but yeah, it's very interesting that they somehow seem to always foreshadow the next crew member. I mean, obviously you can kind of consider BB the next crew member as she is an official crew, you know, Straw Hat crew member, but I don't think she was invited to be a crew member right off the get-go, obviously, because, you know, she was, I guess, quote-unquote, a villain (laughs) to begin with. Another thing I wanted to talk about was um, Zoro and Sanji actually having a friendly conversation and actually calling each other by their real names. It's kind of weird to see, actually, because it's been a while since I've rewatched these episodes. And, you know, we all know throughout the rest of the series, they have this sort of, you know, rivalry between each other. And I don't think they've really called each other by their real names since this point in the series. You know, we always have Zoro calling Sanji like Love Cook or or like uh, Curly Eyebrows, you know, Gejimayu or like, um, you know, Stupid Cook and stuff like that. And, you know, Sanji's always calling him Moss Head or Marimo Head. Um, and so, yeah, they, they are always calling each other by these insult names and never actually saying their real names. And it's kind of, I don't know, it's a little unsettling to actually hear, you know, Sanji calling Zoro Zoro and Zoro calling Sanji Sanji it's just really weird and yeah it's kind of interesting to see them actually have like a more calm conversation because you know from this point on in the story they're either very antagonistic towards each other or they're always slinging insults at each other and the other thing I wanted to also talk about are the bounty amounts you know it's funny like looking looking back on these bounty amounts that you have like Buggy being like what I think it was 15 million Krieg being 17 million and uh Arlong being like 20 million and then Luffy getting this like 3 mil- 30 million bounty to begin with <laughs> and these values seem so tiny now they seemed huge at the time but you know where Luffy is right now in you know Wano his bounty or after uh or after Whole Cake Island his bounty is at 1.5 billion which is insane. And then, you know, we all we all learn about um, more so. This is kind of spoilery into, like, really far into Wano. So this is for, like, manga-only readers. But we, we find out the bounties for, you know, um, Whitebeard and Shanks and also Gold Roger, which are these monstrously high values. I'm not going to really say them here, but... Yeah, they're <laughs> like looking back on these bounties, it's just like so tiny now. And it's also interesting the that marine that's kind of that nameless marine that's kind of standing atop the balcony speaking to all the other marine officers and making that speech. We never see this guy again. He seems like a pretty high ranking person, but he never shows up, at least to my knowledge. I mean, he kind of looks familiar, but I don't think he's ever been given a name. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Because we've seen most of the high-ranking Marines at this point, like all the vice uh, admirals as well as the admirals. And then, you know, we have Sengoku as the fleet admiral. But yeah, I don't know what this guy is. (laughs) And then lastly, I kind of just wanted to talk about Shanks. And, you know, I mentioned the fact that we kind of now know that he's at least as strong as a Shichibukai. But of course, we know damn well that Shanks is even stronger than that. So I don't even know... In retrospect, this conversation seems kind of weird because either White Be- or either Mihawk is way stronger than we really think, and I think he is. I, I honestly think he's just he he's kind of a weird pirate in the world of One Piece. But yeah, Shanks is obviously a Yonko or an Emperor, and you know he has Conqueror's Haki rivaling Whitebeard and maybe even like Roger. But it's just crazy to think that <laughs> Mihawk thinks he can beat Shanks. But I feel like Shanks is like one of the strongest people in the series, even by this point. Because I can't imagine he got this like huge strength boost in the two-year time skip. I mean, I guess he could. I mean, Luffy and all of them did. But it's just strange to see this conversation. And we kind of get an inkling of how strong Shanks is. But we we won't really know until much, much later. Till we learn about the concept of the Emperor's 
as well as when he meets Whitebeard and has that conversation to try and warn him to not have Ace go after Blackbeard. Then we see their hockeys being tested against each other. And it's just kind of weird to see this scene. And yeah, it's it's really fun to actually look back on these scenes to kind of see where these characters have come and like just how the power scaling has come. And One Piece is actually despite how long it is it's actually done a pretty good job of maintaining its power scaling and not letting it spiral out of control like some other series you know (laughs) aka dragon ball um and so yeah it's nice to see that but yeah that's kind of all i really wanted to talk about in the spoiler section here but yeah if you enjoyed this um give me a like or whatever and uh i will see you on the next episode see ya